Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute's Center for Constitutional Studies. Joining me is Tim Lynch, director of the Cato Institute's Project on Criminal Justice. So, Tim, we're going to have an interesting discussion today of, of this, creating a sensible criminal justice system from a libertarian standpoint. And I guess sort of the first question for that would be, what is the proper scope of criminal law from a libertarian point of view? OK. Well, I think we would start with the role of government generally and we agree with the idea set forth in the Declaration of Independence that individuals have the right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness and the role of the government is to secure those rights. So when we are talking about the criminal law, I think we would want the police and prosecutors to be investigating, arresting and prosecuting those who interfere with those rights, people who steal, people who uh, beat other people up, rape and, and murder. So it's those basic core offenses is where we want uh, the government to be uh, utilizing criminal law procedures. Do we think there's something uniquely criminal about a, a violation like that that's different than a fender bender? Right when I when I get into a fender bender on the road, we don't usually call it a criminal offense. But if I punch someone in the face, we usually do. Is there a big difference there? Well, yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, we normally do not think the it's the place for the police and the prosecutors to get involved with accidents. That is something that should be handled through our civil law. It's not somebody deliberately, uh, you know, trying to interfere with your life, liberty, or property. If I were, if somebody were to deliberately try to run you down with their car, you know, that's attempted murder, and that would be treated differently. And it's safe to say, though, the libertarian worldview would have fewer crimes than we have now, probably. Much fewer crimes. That's that's right. One of the problems with uh, our expansive criminal code today. Uh, is that it diverts the police and our criminal justice system away from what they should be focusing on, which is these core offenses. Uh, there's a lot of theft that goes on that uh, the police are simply too busy doing other things in order to uh, track down those offenders. And one of those, of course, is, is drug offense. And a lot of people would know that libertarians are, are not very high on prohibition of drugs. Uh, it doesn't seem like something that would be a crime if no one else is involved. That's right. Uh, as far as like our present work today at the Cato Institute, we put a lot of emphasis on the drug war because it does uh, involve uh, an incredibly big part of our present day criminal justice system. When you look at what the police are focusing on, where uh, prosecutor time and court time and, and where our prison space is being devoted, it is on uh, drug war offenses and this is something, as you said, from the libertarian point of view should not even be a crime in the first place. So this is one of our top priorities. And of course saying it's not a crime does not mean that it's not something that the state maybe shouldn't be involved with at all. I've had many people ask me, well, are there any drugs that should be illegal at all? Uh, you know, marijuana, we're starting to have more people agree, but heroin, maybe, maybe the state can be involved, but maybe it shouldn't be a crime. Well, I think the role of the government when it comes to drugs should be to facilitate informed decision making. That means that if somebody wants to sell a drug, uh, it's OK for the government to put like labeling requirements on this so people know what the ingredients are, uh, you know, recommended dosages uh, and possible side effects if the drug is being used with something else. I think the government has a role there uh, in helping people make informed decisions about how they want to use drugs. But uh, should people be sent to prison for using a drug that the government thinks is, is wrong or shouldn't be used? No, that, that wouldn't be a, an appropriate place for the government or the criminal law. And what about the, the federal role in that, of course, too? Because that seems to be not a very good use of federal power. If you're going to have drugs be illegal, it doesn't seem constitutional to have it be on a federal level. Right. Now we're shifting away from like libertarian theory into uh, uh, our American system and how our criminal justice system is organized in America under our constitution. And under our constitution, the primary uh, role for 
the criminal law is basically at our state and local level. At the federal level, uh, our federal constitution really speaks of just three federal offenses, piracy, counterfeiting and treason and they, they never expected the, the federal government to be involved in much of the everyday uh, crime fighting type of stuff like the violent crime we were talking about earlier you know, with, with the murders and the muggings and theft and these types of things. They all expected the, the local governments to handle that type of thing. Uh, the role of the federal government uh, – uh, should be very, very limited in the, in the, in the criminal law context. And uh, as you were saying, these days, much of the time and resources of the federal government is involved in the drug war. And so I assume that the federal prison population is not mostly filled of pirates, counterf <laughs> counterfeiters and treason, people committed treason? Absolutely not. Uh, most of the federal prisoners are, are in there on drug violations. The overwhelming number of them are. Uh, now, the federal government and the federal criminal code has been expanding uh, like crazy for the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, we started out with those three basic uh, federal offenses. It is now ballooned to about uh, four or 5,000 uh, federal statutes that are on the books. Now, these aren't all – prosecuted evenly. Some of them are obscure. There's not many people in prison for them. Uh, the main uh, statute that is violated is the Controlled Substances Act, which is the, the, the basis for federal drug offenses. And that was passed in, in 68. And I think that's part of the story that we should tell here is, is criminal – the criminal code and then the prison population and going basically since the 60s forward. Um, and, and especially in terms of imprisonment, uh, how many people we're actually imprisoning now and what those numbers are. Uh, uh, do you have those numbers uh, in terms of what rate of imprisonment we're, we are? We, uh, we are locking up uh, more than 2 million people in the United States. Now, to put that into some kind of perspective, it took us more than 200 years to lock up the first million. And it's just over the past 30, 30, 35 years that we've locked up the second million. To give you an idea of the rapid expansion of our, of our prison population, during the 1990s and early 2000s, we were building on average a prison a week in the United States. Incredible amount of prison expansion and as soon as they were – Built, they were rapidly filled up uh, uh, with people, with prisoners, and again, most of it. The engine behind uh, all of this is the drug war. Yeah, the the drug population in the prisons is is very big, and, and the numbers are, are pretty stark too. We have about twenty three percent of the people in the world who are imprisoned total. Uh, there's there's about ten million people who are imprisoned across the entire world. And of those, 10 million, 2.2 million of them are Americans, uh, which gives us nearly 25 percent. In terms of the way that we do this, in terms of crime rates, uh, we usually talk – or rates, we usually talk in 100 per 100,000 people. And the current U.S. prison population – and this is both prison and jail – uh, jail being a more temporary type of incarceration than, than prison uh, is about 707 per 100,000 people, which is about 200 more than that bastion of freedom Russia uh, <laughs> who comes in second or Rwanda depending on th those, those bastions of freedom. Uh, so that maybe that means that we need to start thinking about whether or not America is land of the free uh, in that sense. Yeah, the other another way I've heard it expressed is that the US has about 5% of the world's population, but we have as you said about 25% of the world's prisoners. And this does raise immediate questions about, you know, this is supposed to be the land of the free and uh and it raises that basic question about why is it that this country needs to lock up so many people? And we really need to humanize it a little bit because you know you hear about these statistics, but again, behind these numbers is basically what's going on is you're taking a human being and you're saying this person needs to be put into a cage. He needs to be put behind very tall barbed wire fences. Why do we need to put so many of those people in those types of facilities? It really is very troubling. But of course, obvious response would be if the crime rate was going up, 
and and many people believe that it has been going up. Uh, but if the crime rate was going rate was going up, then you probably should have more people in prison. Is, does that explain the prison population? Well, what I say is, I, I, I think there is a connection between uh, locking people up and the crime rate. But the, what needs to be said is that if you take somebody who his plan for the day is to go mug people, if you take that person off the streets and out of the neighborhoods and you put them in a prison cell, you know, that's going to have an impact on crime in the neighborhood. If you lock up a rapist or you lock up somebody who, again, his, he's a career criminal and what he does every day or every week is break into somebody's home to steal things. If you lock these types of people up, it is going to have an impact on crime. But if you take somebody you know, like a teenager who is selling drugs on the corners in Baltimore or in Los Angeles and you take a person like that and you put them in a prison cell, it doesn't have any impact at all on the drug trade. And that is what has been going on. We're taking tens of thousands of people like that and putting them in our prison facilities and it's it's really not having any impact on the drug trade. That is a thriving black market today as it has been for years. And interestingly, the, the crime rate is uh, has always been a big driver of this but in, in, a, in an interesting way. So bef be starting about the late 60s, up through the early 90s, crime went up pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, and actually, between 74 and 84, the murder rate doubled in the, in the country. So if you look at prison population numbers, in 1972, we had about 161 per 100,000 people in prison. And by 2007, we had 767. Uh, what isn't seen in that data though is that starting at about 94, 93, 94, the crime rate started plummeting. And uh, and then the, there was a huge divergence between the prison rate, which was still going up, and the crime rate, which was going down, and is, is still actually going down, even though Pew polls and other polls show that most people believe it's still going up. So, uh, and crime rate does not actually explain the reason for this incarceration. The the main way you explain it is the creation of new crimes, in the sense of the drug war and then some other uh, expansion of the federal criminal code. The enforcement without leniency of putting more people in prison for doing those crimes and then the higher punitive nature of the sentences that are being applied to those crimes, mandatory minimums, three strike laws, all those things create the constellation and of course the fact that for the longest time there was never a bad – the voters always voted for more criminal enforcement. What could be the downside of voting for more criminal enforcement? Yeah, that's right. I mean the politicians uh, pandered to fear over crime and uh, every single congressional term it was another crime package where they were saying that these measures, mandatory minimums, more penalties, more prosecutors were were necessary in order to address the crime problem and there was just that never-ending expansion of uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, all under this rubric of, of being tough on crime. We sometimes compare the drug war to the uh, dangerous experiment with alcohol prohibition. And one thing we have to remember from that experience is that when we ended alcohol prohibition, the violent crime rate in the country declined for 10 straight years. And so even though the crime rate has been going down in this country, we I think we would see even further declines in violent crime once we were to move away from the drug war because we do have these rival gangs that do fight one another from time to time in order to get control over uh, the lucrative drug territory. Uh, of course, we're hearing more about the horrendous violence in Mexico and Central America, but that violence sometimes creeps over to the border into our cities like Los Angeles where the Crips and the Bloods fight one another. The thing that's really hard to measure too is the the violent crime or other related crime in, uh, that is doesn't seem to be drug related but is drug related and people have tried to figure out you have a certain amount of people in prison for drug crimes, uh, drug related crimes. But then you also might have someone in prison for robbery but the reason he was robbing some place is because that he needed money to get heroin uh, which produces more prison population. And Some of the numbers that we had at least on the federal level uh, in 1980, the drug related imprisonment rate on a federal level was three per 100,000 and by 2000, it was 35 per 100,000, which is a 10 times increase 
that was all concurrent with the war on drugs, with Reagan's uh, uh, escalation and public education programs, all that concurrent uh, didn't seem to decrease the amount of drug users. Yeah, that's right. And the other uh, thing, uh, perverse consequence of the drug war is that you know we've got these drug offenders in prison right now, and they're there with these mandatory minimum penalties of you know ten, fifteen, twenty years. And so when you have a prison facility that's operating over its capacity, and you're the warden, and then you know you know there's going to be two hundred more prisoners coming next month, he has to release some prisoners, and he can't release the nonviolent drug offenders because they're there under these mandatory minimums, which means they can't be released uh, so what happens perversely is that they end up letting the violent criminals, you know the muggers and the rapists, child molester, these types uh, they let them out of these prison facilities before they have served their full sentence in order to make room for more nonviolent drug offenders and so it makes our communities less safe. How do we get to the point of mandatory minimums? Uh, what was sentencing like before we had these in the in the 50s or 60s? Well, what what happened is that, you know, uh, crime and the concerns over crime became a political issue and then I think you had uh, some sensationalized cases of where maybe uh, some judges did let uh, some violent offenders, they got lenient sentences and then they committed other horrendous violent crimes and politicians um, uh, picked up on some of the outrage in the community over that. Uh, but it was kind of like we lost our perspective about whether that was typical, whether it was common. And so you had some of these sensationalized cases drive the policy change to say, these politicians who kind of demagogued a little bit and in some states and said, you know, we can't trust judges to mete out proper sentences. So we're going to take it out of the hands of judges by saying, all right, from now on, all prisoners will get these mandatory minimum penalties, you know, whether it's 5, 10, 15, 20 years. During the uh, Bush Dukakis run in 88, there was a big story about someone the Dukakis had let, let out. Uh, was it Willie Horton? Was That's right. Uh, in Massachusetts, they had these policies in place where – I mean Dukakis didn't specifically you know, say this prisoner should be let out. But he had policies in place in his state where you had violent offenders uh, spending time in halfway houses where they, they – could roam the community free and one of those prisoners was Willie Horton, uh, a person with a long history of violent crime and when he was put into one of these halfway houses, he went out and committed more violent crime. So the Bush administration picked up on that and said, you know, Dukakis and Massachusetts and the policies they have in place there are too liberal for the United States and so they made crime a big issue over that. Let's go back to something you mentioned previously about, about the federal criminal code. Uh, and the 4,000 to 5,000 uh, federal criminal statutes. Uh, we often call that over-criminalization, um, uh, which is discussed a lot by Cato and Heritage Foundation, National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. Um, what does that term over-criminalization generally mean, especially in the federal context? It means that the government is beginning to criminalize activities uh, that it shouldn't. And that can mean it's the federal government is duplicating crimes that are already on the books at the state and local level um, or turning regulatory infractions that had been previously handled with like a civil fine, turning those into criminal offenses and then felonies where people could actually go to prison for what had previously been considered a, a civil – you know, paperwork violation, and we've seen uh, the proliferation of those types of crimes over the years just multiply and multiply and multiply. Till we today, we have a, a spider web of regulations where it's really hard for almost anybody to go through life without tripping over one of these rules or regulations. And we have some – there's always interesting stories in this uh, that I personally uh, have favorites and I'm putting that in scare quotes because they're horrible stories. Uh, but they're, this is the good use of the word Kafka-esque or Orwellian, especially when you get wrapped up in a criminal procedure that should never have happened to you. Um, do you have a personal favorite story of the in the overcriminalization literature? Well, one um – 
One story uh, it involves a guy named Brian Aiken who um, – who purchased some firearms in Colorado and then he was in the process of moving to New Jersey and he knew New Jersey had stricter rules in place than Colorado. But everybody agrees that he lawfully purchased a few firearms in Colorado and he was in the process of moving to New Jersey and he checked with the local police about what he had to do in order to comply with New Jersey law and despite that, uh, he was pulled over and the police searched his car, found these firearms and they prosecuted him for uh, felony violations of New Jersey's gun laws. And at every turn, the system just seemed to break down. He thought uh, – Brian Aiken thought if he talked to the police officers, he could convince them of the circumstances of his case. And once they understood he was in the process of moving and he showed them his paperwork for the lawful violations that they would – uh, you know, let him go, but that didn't happen. Then he thought he could explain it to the prosecutors, and they would get them to drop the charges, but that didn't happen. And then he went to trial, confident that a jury would acquit him once they knew all of the surrounding circumstances. But then, to his chagrin, the judge uh, would not. After the jury would come back in his case and ask for like more. Uh, explanations as to the law and what the law is with respect to moving to the state. The judge denied these requests from the jury and the jury ended up coming back and, and convicting him. It was like a total breakdown of the system and it is an example about how um, ordinary people who don't you know, consider themselves to be criminals, who people when you hear this story, you can't believe it happened that there has to be something else there that I'm not telling you. But these things do happen and uh, it's very tragic and it's hard to believe that this is America when you hear that type of thing. What happened eventually to Brian? Well, the judge refused these overtures from the jury to get more instructions and so the jury came back and convicted him. Uh, fortunately for Brian, there was uh, a lot of people in New Jersey paying attention to his case. They were like talk – radio hosts who kind of kept his case in the news and eventually uh, they sought a, a pardon from Governor Chris Christie. Uh, so after he had served several months, uh, what Christie did was commute his sentence. He didn't give him a full pardon, which is I think what he deserved, but he commuted his sentence so he was he was released. But he is still facing other things associated with his criminal conviction. He cannot own firearms. Uh, he's had trouble with uh, custody of his son over this criminal violation. He's ineligible to, uh, you know, have a, a certain go into certain professions because of his criminal violations. So, although he's out of the prison walls, this is something that continues to hobble him in his life. Uh, yeah, that story is is absolutely astounding. Um, and unfortunately, it's it's one of many. Uh, one of the ones that that most gets me is the story of a guy named Abner Schoenwetter who uh, was a lobster fish, fisherman in the in the Gulf area. Right. He he would uh, fish for these spiny lobster tails, uh, and which had different links associated with them. And at one point, uh, when he was brought back onto uh, com coming back onto shore with his lobster tail catch, because apparently the story goes that some competitor of his apparently reported him to the feds, but they searched his boat and they found that he had been packaging these lobster tails in p cardboard boxes rather than bags, or maybe vice versa. It was either bags or versus boxes. One of it was the wrong right. thing according to regulations. And so he was accused of violating a, a statute that was called the called the Lacey Act, which is makes it illegal to transport uh, wildlife, flora and fauna within the United States, and taken in violation of another country's laws. This other country was Honduras, um, and, and the accusation was basically that he was a poacher who was poaching Honduran. Uh, the Honduran wildlife, the Honduran spiny lobsters, and he was violating Honduran law, which made it into a federal offense with a possible multiple year prison sentence. And at every single point of this, that was never a defense that he didn't know uh, 
about Honduran law. He, did, he didn't know how to comply with Honduran law because ignorance to the law is no, no defense is, is, is often said and that is true. And the federal prosecutors who I can't decide if they were either sadists or political grandstanding, uh, they kept putting out press releases saying that they had captured a, a huge poaching ring <laughs> and then they got every one of his partners into play because, because now all the money that they had ever made on lobsters was all contraband money. So it was basically just like drug money to them. So now they get all these these uh, money laundering charges, and eventually he's got he gets eight years in prison. A seventy year old man gets eight years in prison for this. And the crazy part of this, at one point in this story, Honduras keeps coming back. I was in, just going to say that yeah, they keep coming back in and saying this is not our law. This is not our law. This is wrong. They they file briefs with the court and say this is a wrong interpretation of our law. This did not violate our laws. But at, at some point, it was just irrelevant that Honduras said it didn't violate their laws. And I've I've met that man, and and he's he's tried since he got out of prison. He's about eighty now, I think. To to tell Congress that this is absurd. There is no reason anyone should be spending any time in prison for putting lobster tails in the wrong packaging. But nevertheless, we do it all the time. Right, and the the uh, that is such a sad story. I mean, even when the defense team, as you said, got officials from the country of Honduras to file a brief in his defense saying what this man did did not violate our law. Therefore, it would have made the Lacey prosecution uh, fall apart because it hinges on a violation of foreign law. And yet the federal prosecutors continued for whatever reason. Yeah, it's, it's totally bizarre and, and very troubling. And, and the other aspect of these cases is that these people – can't believe it's happening to them and then their own attorneys sometimes will go to them and tell them, even though we think what you did did not violate the law, we think you should nevertheless plead guilty because this – if you insist on going to trial, this may take years to resolve and you'll end up going bankrupt paying my law firm uh, all of these fees in order to defend you in court whereas if you plead guilty early in the process, uh, Maybe the federal prosecutors will bump it down to a misdemeanor. You'll serve three months and and get out of prison. And uh, it's a very difficult situation for people because you know it's easy for people to say, "Well, I'd never plead guilty to anything I didn't do." But for so many of these people, when they've got relatives, you know, people to support in their family, and uh, the prospects of bankruptcy. Uh, uh, versus, you know, a, a twenty-year prison sentence versus one year. Um, it's not so easy uh, to 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 make these decisions, and and a lot of them end up when their own attorneys are telling them they should plead guilty. They end up uh, pleading guilty to charges, even though they think they're innocent, and then uh, they'll carry that around for the rest of their life, uh, uh, you know, filled with resentment about the way that in which their government treated them as they should. And the plea bargaining system is, of course, most people aren't getting trials, right? Uh, I mean, criminal trials are not the main way we deal with defendants now. Yeah, that's one thing I always impress on my in my lectures because most people have this mistaken idea. They they kind of know in a general way that we have plea bargains, and some people plead guilty, and some people go to trial. But they really don't realize how lopsided the system is. Ninety-five percent or more of our cases in the American criminal justice system do not go to trial. They're resolved through some kind of plea bargain arrangement. Um, only a handful of cases go to trial and these are the ones that you sometimes hear about on the news because uh, you know it might be a celebrity or somebody, somebody like that who can afford to pay um, – uh, it's either celebrities that can afford to pay a legal team to go to trial or sometimes it, it involves a horrendous offense where the person really has nothing to lose by going to trial, you know, like in a murder type case. And the very proliferation of the criminal code facilitates this plea bargaining system because they can put 10, 15, 20 charges on you, uh, conspiracy, money laundering, everything related to it and then have you – 
you know, you know, in every possible direction, wrapped up in the criminal code, and give you a huge, daunting task to try and explain to a jury that this entire thing is ridiculous. Just happened to Mr. Schoenwetter and the lobster tails, and of course, his crime was a was a strict liability crime too. Which, uh, would, if you could explain what that is, right? A strict liability crime uh, does away with the idea of what lawyers call criminal intent. And criminal intent used to be a basic part of our criminal justice system. It basically means that you, you know, there's a line between lawful and unlawful conduct, and then you deliberately crossed over that line. That's the idea behind criminal intent, and so a criminal punishment is appropriate. But in a strict liability offense, it means that uh, the prosecution does not have to prove that you deliberately crossed the line. And what that means is that it, people can get trapped up and tripped up over vague rules and regulations that they don't understand. Um, fortunately, like when it comes to our tax laws, everybody understands how complicated the tax code is. But you can't be prosecuted for tax evasion uh, unless the prosecution can prove that you deliberately falsified something uh, in order to you know, evade your taxes. You can't be criminally prosecuted for a tax violation kind of like because of an accidental computation or something like that. And what we need is that type of safeguard with respect to all the other regulations that the federal government has put in place. But we don't have that and that's why some people can kind of get tripped up by the Lacey Act and some of these other arcane regulations that are out there. It seems like we just see a, a constitutional amendment that says that no one will go to prison for mispackaging lobster tails. Maybe not that specific, but at least something that says these these cannot be uh, situations, crimes that because they, crimes is the wrong word. They're civil violations at, at the very least uh, that could ever put someone behind bars, or, or at least the rule of lenity, uh, which uh, is an old common law rule. Yeah, that that's a a, a great rule that uh, is is very American that I'm always talking about when these subjects come up. It, the rule of lenity basically says that if an if a rule can be interpreted one of two ways, the citizen ought to get the benefit of the, of the doubt. But uh, oftentimes in our modern law. Uh, the courts give the benefit of the doubt to the prosecutor and the government and their reading of the law and uh, that goes against everything uh, else that uh, you know is in our Bill of Rights uh, you know where we have proof beyond a reasonable doubt where we have uh, protections like the jury must unanimously agree that somebody has violated the law. The rule of lenity should give the benefit of the doubt to the accused, not to the state. So I want to switch gears for the for the last uh, little section here. Uh, we've been talking about increased punitiveness of the justice system, both in terms of what's a crime and how it's going to be punished. We've talked about how the voters would like to vote for more criminal enforcement. Uh, whether it was Democrat or Republican, there was always someone who said, "I'm tough on crime, tough on crime." Always a reason to vote for someone. Uh, but now we have a new thing that came into the into the news recently with the the Ferguson incident when uh, an unarmed black teenager, Michael Brown, was shot by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, which created a bunch of protests. But but I think the thing that at least maybe here at Cato uh, didn't expect because we've been talking about it for so long was that suddenly people would start to notice that these police officers looked like soldiers and what they were doing to respond to the Ferguson protests, they might as well have been in Fallujah. And now we have this discussion of police militarization, uh, something we've been talking about for a while. So can you give us a little bit of background on, on what's happening with our police? in that sense. Yeah. Um, we have been criticizing the militarization of American policing for many, many years. We started in 1999 with a study that we published called Warrior Cops uh, and then followed it up a few years later in 2006 with a study called Overkill by Radley Balco, um, further talking about this militarization trend. There's a couple of things going on, what, what we mean by militarization. On the one hand, we're talking about how our civilian police departments are beginning to emulate the tactics of the military. You mentioned the way they dress, the, the military garb, helmets, camouflage uniforms, M16s, uh, using flashbang grenades in their policing activity. 
At the other end, there is the problem of our formal U.S. military also getting involved in policing activity. So we have you know the Navy in, in the Caribbean looking for drug smugglers and, and that sort of thing. So we have it at both ends uh, of this militarization. But what has come to light uh, and is in the news since Ferguson is how – these local police departments, even small towns, are getting armored vehicles uh, from our Department of Defense. They're getting that are mine resistant for all those <laughs> mines out there that the gangs right. always have those anti-personnel mines. Yeah, these are vehicles that are built for the battlefield, like you said, of, of Fallujah and uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, and yet. All these small towns in America are getting these armored vehicles and they're getting these automatic weapons and and then they're creating these militarized units. And then the second problem is that these militarized units were originally created with the idea that they would be called out in extraordinary situations like a hostage situation, something that's beyond the capability of the ordinary patrol person. And we've gotten away from that as well. Now they're being called out into more routine policing activity where they will go out and execute a warrant for um, somebody who's selling marijuana. These militarized units will roll out um, and execute a search warrant on, on people's homes. Um, in many of them, violent entries with, with like what we call no-knock raids. Uh, describe that a little bit more, the no-knock raids, how those work out. When they're justified, supposedly, yeah. Well, the you know the there's this basic idea in American law called the castle doctrine, which basically goes back to that idea that our homes are supposed to be our castles, and the government is supposed to treat our homes with great respect. And part of that was a, a, a principle called knock and announce. That means the police, when they have to execute a search warrant in somebody's home, they go up to the front door, they knock. They announce that they're the government, that they're there with a search warrant and they give the people inside an opportunity to answer the door so that the search can take place without violence. But we've gotten far away from this with this no-knock tactic um, where the police – you know, you see it on TV sometimes where they run up to the front door. It's one knock and a few seconds later, they use a battering ram to break down the front door and they go rushing in. Um, and this has become really the norm of American policing now uh, where uh, it's battering rams on the front door. Other agents uh, throw these grenades into the windows along the side of the house uh, to distract people on the inside and it just creates a chaotic situation. Sometimes there's – uh, violence because the homeowner, when these things happen in the middle of the night, they think they're being attacked by criminals, not the police. And so they will get retrieved their handgun and there's unfortunate shootings that happen between the civilian uh, occupants and, and, and the police. A few weeks ago in Atlanta, a SWAT team threw a flashbang grenade into a window and it tragically landed in the crib of a toddler. The grenade exploded and that toddler is now in a coma because of it. So there's lots of tragic consequences to these militarized tactics that are in use now. I actually think the toddler uh, was able to get out of the hospital. Uh, uh, so he's kind of OK. Uh, Lucky. But, but that brings up another question is uh, I assume that the police officer being roundly disciplined for their actions and, and getting held accountable for these mistakes. No, not at all. Um, unfortunately, you know, in a situation like that, they will express their regret that they, of course, did not intend to, you know, endanger the life or take the life of of innocent children. But so as a, what is so often the case is that they'll say, "No, we were we were doing what we were trained to do. This is how we." conduct a raid of, of, of people's homes and they'll try to deflect responsibility onto maybe somebody in the house who was selling marijuana or try to deflect responsibility onto an informer who did not tell them everything. Uh, uh, and they there's this failure to accept responsibility for the reckless tactics that they are, are using on, on a weekly basis. But wasn't this just that that what was needed for police to to protect themselves as 
dr drug lords and other criminals started arming themselves more and more? Wasn't this just the right response to make sure that we're protecting our, our men and line, men and women in the line of duty? Well, that is the rationale that that is offered, but when you scrutinize it, it really it really doesn't it really doesn't hold up. I mean, when the when the drug people have weapons, there it's really there to protect them uh, from rival dealers who are coming to rob them. Uh, if they know that the police are coming, you know, there's usually there's not these violent shootouts between drug dealers and the police. If the police announce themselves clearly, uh, they will surrender. Um, but using these types of tactics, what happens is they roll into a neighborhood and try to break into somebody's home at night or very early in the morning, and. As I said, people are – and sometimes these are into the wrong apartments and homes and when that happens, when people are awoken suddenly in these types of situations, they think they're being uh, attacked by criminals and that's why we have a violent shootout. So it's really perverse and counterproductive. So how do they get this gear, this military gear? They are getting it from our Department of Defense uh, who has been making surplus military equipment and weaponry available either for free or at heavily discounted prices to uh, local police departments. And uh, you know, it's not just in the major metropolitan areas. That's one of the things we learned from Ferguson is that uh, people are learning that it's not just – Going to you know L.A., Chicago, and New York, this military weaponry is flowing uh, to small towns all across America, uh, and you know police departments that have you know ten people and haven't had a violent crime problem uh, under the guise of fighting crime and fighting terrorism, uh, they're driving around with these armored vehicles and M16s. Well, it seems like we have a almost military industrial complex now put on top of the military industrial and policing complex for the police who want to get some of this gear and then the military complex who overproduces it of course for our own military and then just decide to distribute it out what's what's the harm what would be the harm of distributing this to the police officers yeah i think that's i think that is definitely part of the problem i mean uh, what do they mean surplus military uh, weaponry and equipment um, why why doesn't can't the us military uh, you know, keep this. Uh, you would think that they would need it at some point. Um, and w the perverse thing is, what's going to happen is they're going to then request in Congress that they need more armored vehicles or they need more M16s. And there's an industry behind this who is more than willing to say, "Okay, we'll produce more for you." Um, it's one of the perversities of, of government. I think the real irony of the situation, going back to sort of the general thing we've been talking about is that voters and politicians, uh, just like there was never a bad vote for, for cri more, more criminal enforcement, getting tougher on crime, there's also a never bad vote, uh, whether as a voter or as a congressman, to protect police officers, uh, definitely to make sure that they're protected. So we started giving them this weaponry. And I think what no one thought would happen would be that the that the weaponry that was given to the police officers would change how the police officers behaved. Uh, that they would start using – we give them a mine-resistant vehicle and we would say, well, they're supposed to use this when they get into very hostage situations, active shooter situations. But maybe what they never thought is that they would use it to just go and serve a search warrant on a bunch of barbers, uh, which, which did happen a few weeks ago, to check their licenses or, or to search everyone at a bar. That They, they just kind of seem to think that the gear is cool and they enjoy using it. I think that's right. And uh, the other point that needs to be made is that these tactics are used against people who don't have uh, any political power, and that's why it kind of goes on year after year. You know, like like I would say, like if these tactics were used against Governor Rick Perry's brother's family or something like that, you could be sure that there would be a big reexamination of the policy of militarized weaponry and tactics in Texas. But when they're used against poor people, uh, they go in and break down doors of apartments and and then the police will either just say sorry and shrug and walk away. Uh, nothing nothing changes. The policy just persists until 
you have like a Michael Brown situation or another situation where somebody is killed and then then the media starts paying attention and starts asking the questions like we've seen in Ferguson about like why do you need this why why is it necessary and then they then you know then finally policymakers are are being forced to answer these questions and now we're having you know hearings on Capitol Hill where these tough questions which should have been you know asked a long time ago are finally being asked unfortunately they don't we don't usually start talking about something like this until something horrible like the Michael Brown situation happened. But let's look at how that whole – the constellation of all these things we've been talking about affect a community like Ferguson uh, in terms of how they have experienced the police and what they think of law. If, if they have a lot of respect for the state um, in the neighborhood of Ferguson because they we have an incredibly punitive criminal justice system which disproportionately affects minorities. Uh, they're getting extremely long prison sentences, uh, uh, African Americans at a rate higher than even accounting for how whether or not they commit crime at a higher weight rate. So for example, African Americans are just about as likely to do drugs as whites, if maybe a little bit more, but negligibly just just about as likely. Yet they are nine to eleven times more likely to be caught doing it, and, and three to five times more likely to serve prison time for doing it. So, and then you have these militarized police to enforce these highly punitive laws and this overbloated criminal code in these neighborhoods that have a racial dispar – with a racial disparity in these racial neighborhoods. And it seems like the only th thing that these people in these neighborhoods could think is that this is basically an occupying force that occasionally comes into their neighborhood, neighborhood takes – young males away, locks them up for a few years for things that they shouldn't be locked up for and then returns them and we're supposed to respect the law enforcement. That seems to be the big underlying story here. I think that's right and uh, a lot of like police tactics that would never be used in the more affluent parts of town are used in these poorer neighborhoods. Question tactics like what we've done been talking about with like no knock raids but also stop and frisk tactics uh, against people who are just pedestrians walking around the neighborhood this is where the police just run up to people and tell them to put their hands against the wall or hands against a car as they're frisked for weapons or drugs these are tactics that would not be tolerated you know in DC like in the Georgetown neighborhoods or Chevy Chase uh, and yet they're used in the poorer neighborhoods. And so the people in the, the poorer neighborhoods have a different experience with the police than middle class people in, who live in other parts of town. And we talk, we're also talking earlier about the number of people that we lock up. But there's also millions of people who are back in the neighborhoods who are there under probation and parole. And these are people who are constantly under threat of arrest – to go back to prison if they like fail a drug test or if they do – if they like miss a curfew or things like that. It's another experience that people just can't relate to you know, when you're living in another part of town. And these are what reporters are starting to pick up on about these simmering tensions that are in these neighborhoods. And when then you have a shooting like with Michael Brown, his body is left in the street for hours. The police just kind of seem to, you know, they start off shrugging like they don't have to identify the officer involved, and people just got the sense that, like, this kid's life isn't worth anything, and as if the department's just going to shrug and everybody's going to move on. That's where things, I think, started to boil over, and why you had uh, the protests in the streets. And I, I always like to remind people that the media. You know, did good reporting on the paramilitary aspect of the Ferguson Police Department, but they were there to report on that. Uh, they didn't arrive because of the shooting of Michael Brown. They went to Ferguson because people were protesting, and, and the, the and the national media went to Ferguson to find out what the protesting was all about. And I'm glad they did. And now they're beginning to shine a light on some of these simmering tensions, not only in Ferguson but other cities around the country. And the Ferguson Police Department was just totally caught off guard by the scrutiny that the media brought. You know, we got those reports about the reporters being uh, roughed up for not doing any. You know, they were sitting in a McDonald's writing their stories, and suddenly uh, you have Ferguson Police Department officers roughing them up, and we had the. 
the uh, officers, you know, pointing weapons at people who weren't doing anything. And they were really – the department was caught off guard by this scrutiny and it was a – it was good. It was a shining a light on what goes on all the time and so we're finally having a discussion about that. It seems that having that that sense in the in these communities of which Ferguson is just an example, especially inner city African American communities, other minority communities, having the the people in those communities have a sense that the cops are not working for them, helping them out. Uh, they're not part of the community. That seems to, it would hurt so many different levels of, of being able to get criminal enforcement, being able to solve crimes uh, because the people wouldn't want to work with the police. It would, it's, it's a huge problem to have the, the sense that the police aren't occupying force rather than part of the community. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean and going back full circle to where we started about the role of the criminal law, I mean – it's like the police the, – the original idea of the police was uh, – we used to call them peace officers. Like when there's a disturbance, they come on the scene to restore the peace. But these days, they roll into neighborhoods and you know, in these militarized units to execute a no-knock raid in the middle of the night, they are coming in and they are often creating the disturbance. And uh, the people in these neighborhoods don't feel that the police are coming in to help them you know help them you know in a because their house has been burglarized they're going to the police are there to help them recover their property and find the perpetrator that he won't you know commit another offense against their neighbors or their relatives they don't have that sense at all it's like the police are rolling into their neighborhoods threatening everybody with arrest uh unless they you know s snitch on somebody uh, and it's a it's a totally different experience with the police and one as you said the, the the phrase that you hear over and over again is you feel like they're an occupying threatening force rather than a helpful force. So, what do we do? And in, in the bigger picture, it seems like all of these things are connected. Uh, what can we do to try and solve at least some small part of this? Well, there's a lot to be done. Um, uh, we need to stop this militarization trend. That's the the first thing uh, that needs to be done the, to get at the root of so many of these problems. Uh, uh, we need to end the drug war. That is really creates a whole other uh, multi layered uh, set of problems just by waging this billion dollar uh, war on drugs. That that is uh, uh, the main thing that needs to be done. Uh, and fortunately, the political climate is beginning to shift on that, at least with respect to marijuana. So we have states like Colorado and Washington and other states this fall that are reexamining their laws on marijuana. So that is a, a big sign of progress. But once we get that done, there are other things that need to be done, getting back to that idea of criminal intent and working our way back to uh, the first principles uh, of our government and the role of the criminal law in our society. We need to keep working our way back to that. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, you can find us on Twitter at FreeThoughtsPod. That's FreeThoughtsPod. FreeThoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more, you can find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.